Hello and welcome to our next webinar session. Um, we will be talking today about our EMDC product family, our uh, PIR sensor with NFC interface. My name is Markus Florian. I just briefly switch on my camera uh, so that you can see myself. So here, that's me, Markus Florian. I run the sales team at Enocean. I'm uh, based in Oberhaching in Germany. And uh, today, with, together with my colleague, we will guide you through uh, the presentation and introduce you to our PIR sensor. So this is again the continuation of our successful webinar series where we uh, introduce you to our latest and greatest products. Um, so let me give you some guide you through our agenda and then of course also a few words to an ocean our company so yeah as mentioned uh, we'll be making an introduction to an ocean the company uh, then i will be handing over to my colleague matthias kassner who then uh, will then give you a detailed uh, explanation and introduction about uh, the goals of such a product and of course the use cases and then give a more detailed introduction and explanation about the features uh, which are integrated. And at the end, of course, uh, we will have a session, Q&A session, where you can raise your questions, which we are going to answer live during the webinar. And um, then, of course, then also try to respond to immediately to your most immediate uh, questions. Okay, so let me uh, give you um, an overview about an ocean. For those who don't know us, an ocean, so we are the leader in self-powered IoT solutions. We use uh, energy harvesting concepts in our component and modules, which are then used in various applications. And in that context, we use, of course, wireless communication. We are geared around the use of standardized protocols. And in that case, in that context, we make use of uh, an ocean protocol, of course, our protocol, which is an open standard since over 10 years. Um, it's uh, in the sub gigahertz range where we use three frequencies, which are namely 868 for Europe, 902 for US and Canada, and 928 uh, for Japan. And then we have added also support for 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequencies. Uh, there is mainly uh, the ZigBee protocol, which we are supporting. And then most recently, about two years ago, we have added also support for Bluetooth low energy. Uh, during our activities, we have shipped a double digit million number of products into the market since 2003. And those solutions are used in over 1 million buildings worldwide. So those are buildings which range from small private homes up to big office buildings or even hospitals. Uh, our team is consisting of a worldwide uh, presence. So we have our headquarters in Europe, uh, in Germany. Then, of course, we have teams around Europe, in France, UK, in the Nordics. We do have also a team presence in North America. And, of course, we also have a presence in Far East. Our activities are uh, geared around um, a very strong and wide patent portfolio, which then supporting our activities and development for these innovative products. So that's everything about our company. And now I hand over to Matthias, who gives you an introduction to our PIR product. So uh, over to you, Matthias. Thank you very much, Marcus. Welcome, everybody. My name is Matthias Kasner. I'm in charge of product marketing uh, at Enocean, and I will guide you through the latest features and typical applications uh, about our latest uh, product, the motion detector EMDC. So first of all, let's understand uh, what are our goals uh, when building uh, automation, our goals uh, with products uh, that Enocean is developing. Our aim is to enable functional, flexible, and intelligent buildings. So what does this mean, the functional, flexible, and intelligent buildings? If we look at the biggest office building in Germany, which you can see on the picture below, this is the square uh, located in Frankfurt, right outside uh, of the airport. This is Germany's largest office building, and it uses over 18,000 self-powered sensors with an ocean technology to make this building not only functional, but also intelligent and flexible. So what type of sensor data do we collect in, a, in such a building? First of all, we collect user input, like signals from light switches, uh, signals from temperature dials, uh, signals from the windows and from the door. We measure environmental conditions, uh, such as temperature, humidity, light level. We detect the motion, uh, meaning is somebody moving around an area? is an office space occupied, and this will be a large topic of our call today. 
And we use this information to drive self-powered controls for light, air quality, your heating and ventilation system, humidity, temperature. And additionally, we use this information to gain insight into what is happening in the building. How is it utilized? What uh, can I do to improve uh, office uh, utilization? So motion is a critical part of this. And we will look at use cases uh, in a second. So if you want to understand uh, what is going on in a building, if you want to understand the status of a building and make intelligent decisions, then we need real-time sensor data. So we need to have information about the status of our building. How are the different workplaces uh, occupied? How are they utilized? What is the current temperature? What is the air quality level? Uh, what uh, desks are available for people to use? In what areas are a lot of people uh, currently working? And these data can be used to, to make uh, decisions. Decisions about uh, guide people to the next uh, free desk, decision about staffing levels, about cleaning, about how much personnel is needed. They can be used uh, to adjust the air, air conditioning system and provide comfortable working air environment depending on your individual preference. So all of this is based on data from sensors. Sensor data gives us an insight into what is happening in our building. Now to get such type uh, of insight, we need to have these sensors. And the most important thing when deploying sensors is they must be easy to install and they must have a high flexibility. Why is that? Today we see in office spaces uh, a trend towards very flexible buildings and very flexible construction schemes driven by what is called shared office spaces. So today, no longer is a building uh, built with dedicated offices uh, that have always the same layout. Rather, they are typically built as an open office space where you can uh, build different meeting rooms, different meeting zones, individual offices according to demand. So you can see typical examples on these pictures here. And you can imagine if you change the size of an office, uh, if you make an office space into a meeting space or vice versa, then your sensors that capture information have to be adjusted uh, accordingly. So it's important to have wireless solutions that are truly wireless, meaning not only do they communicate wirelessly, but they also do not need any wiring for the power supply. So the first and important observation is to build truly wireless systems they must have their own power source because as long as you have to supply power to them, they are not really wireless. Now, the moment uh, you require a power source uh, in sensors in your building, the question is, what could this be? Historically, the answer was uh, we use batteries. It's very cheap, very easy. Everybody understands uh, batteries uh, from home. So why not do the same uh, in an office building? Now keep in mind on the first slide of this building that we saw, the Squire, with uh, its over 18,000 different sensors. If you imagine each of those having a battery, you can immediately see that maintenance uh, will become an issue. So you will have devices failing over time. You will have maintenance due to uh, repair requests and your office spaces will not be usable once you are doing uh, the exchange of the batteries. So this is a huge impact both on user satisfaction the users of the office, which is not operational, will be uh, somewhat disappointed, but also a cost factor because maintenance means cost. And this is the key proposition of energy harvesting devices. They generate their energy from the environment and are therefore maintenance free because they eliminate the need to change batteries. Now, what are key use cases of such sensors in general? and of the motion detectors uh, in particular. Now you have seen uh, the picture already uh, on the start. We want to understand what is going on in our building. And a lot of this understanding starts with knowing which of the spaces in my building are actually occupied right now, which of the spaces are utilized right now, and where are available spaces? Where's the next free meeting room? Where's the next free desks? And this information about the utilization of my building are provided by motion detectors. So quite commonly, they are therefore also referred to as occupancy sensors. 
because they tell you if a certain area is occupied or not. Once you have this information, not only can you guide people to the next free desk, or can uh, determine uh, the level of utilization, but uh, in times right now, like right now, uh, where cleaning is a big issue due to coronavirus, this enables you to provide healthy workplaces. Now, in many offices today, especially if you have shared offices, you have to clean after the desks have been used uh, to have a healthy environment once the next occupant uh, is utilizing it. So today, how is this done? In many cases, uh, all office desks are cleaned without any discrimination. Or sometimes we see uh, schemes where you leave a sign behind you. This desk needs cleaning. Now, quite clearly, this is not an ideal solution. And now if you imagine you have deployed uh, occupancy sensors to understand which of your desks are occupied, then it's very easy to extend the information that you have gathered from these sensors to, towards uh, determining if uh, cleaning uh, is required. So, and uh, this, can, uh, this can be done without any manual processing steps, with, uh, without the need uh, to manually uh, call a cleaning service. So there's a fully automated uh, solution based on existing data that you get uh, from your occupancy sensor. Now, the second aspect, of course, is uh, the booking system. In many office buildings, uh, assets such as conference rooms uh, come at a premium. I know from my experience here, we never seem to have uh, enough conference rooms. So we continuously have to check, uh, is there a free room? Is there a free office uh, that I might be able to use? And now even here, you can use the information gathered from motion detectors to determine if a meeting room is available or not. So you can easily detect if a meeting has ended ahead of the scheduled time, or if a meeting has not even started because somebody has booked a room but never turned up. And you can use this information not only to put a nice sign on the door, but also to automatically update your booking system and thereby give a live view of your available meeting rooms to your booking system. Now, what else can you do? Of course, with uh, occupancy sensors or motion detectors, you can conserve energy. And here's a question for you. What would you guess where most energy is actually spent in an office building? So the, this is a question uh, you will see uh, on your screen, uh, a little user interface where you can select, uh, what do you think? You have an office building and now obviously energy is spent for different purposes there. They can be spent uh, on lighting, they can be spent on heating, cooling, ventilation. They can be spent on transportation, such as uh, escalators uh, and lift. They can be spent in the IT infrastructure. So which of these areas uh, do you think uh, consumes most of the power? So what do you think? Is it, is it lighting? Is it heating or cooling? Now, obviously it depends a little bit. Uh, in some areas you might need more heating and some areas you might need more cooling. In some, some areas might be very bright, some might be very dark. If you have a high rise building, then probably you have a lot of escalators. But as a general rule of thumb uh, about where most of the energy is spent in a commercial office building. So what do you guess? Lighting, heating, cooling ventilation, escalators. So now, uh, now is a good moment uh, to make your choice. And what can we see? The result is, Heating, cooling, ventilation uh, with a staggering 83%, followed by lighting. Uh, sadly, nobody went for escalators uh, and also the IT infrastructure. And of course, you are absolutely correct. The majority uh, of energy in a building is spent on heating, cooling, and ventilation. As a rule of thumb, that's typically about 40% of the overall energy consumption for office buildings. So of course, depends a little bit on where the building is located. Is it a very hot area, very cold area, something in between? So here's a study from the Australian government uh, on energy conservation. And this found in their case, 39% uh, of the energy was related to HVAC. And then the next 25% being lighting. So these two things uh, combined are almost the two thirds uh, of your energy consumption. And if we look uh, in the HVAC systems, where does actually all the energy go to? The majority goes to fans. 
So these are devices distributing the warm or cool air, devices that can be controlled quite easily uh, based on occupancy of a room. So the key takeaway is that smart HVAC control based on motion detectors provide you significant energy savings. So simply turning down the ventilation when nobody's in a room, maybe turning down the heating uh, when nobody's in the room, switching off ventilators when a window is open can dramatically reduce your energy consumption. Now, after that, uh, after HVAC, the second most important area uh, of energy optimization uh, is often lighting. Here we have, of course, already the trend uh, towards LED lighting that is in progress, far from complete. But in addition to that, you can automatically switch off your lighting in unoccupied rooms, automatically switch it on if somebody enters the room so people understand that here's an automatic system that does not require manual interaction. And you can also automatically adjust the light level based on the amount of incoming light to avoid a situation uh, like below on the right, where you have a nice bright day, lots of light coming in, an empty meeting room, and still illumination is going uh, at full power. So these are typical use cases that you can address with motion detectors or occupancy sensors, as they are often called. Now let's have a look at our latest product, the EMDC motion detector. EMDC is a self-powered ceiling mounted sensor that measures motion and illumination and can be configured with an NFC interface. You can see it on a picture in the center. So the big black area that you see is the solar cell that harvests energy from the environment. Above that to the left, you see a light level sensor that measures the light level directly in front of the sensor. And then a big white thing is the lens. Is the infrared lens. So let's have a look how this works. First of all, the energy harvesting part. Energy harvesting means clean energy from the environment. We reuse energy that is already present. What type of energy can this be? We typically work with three different energy sources. We work with kinetic energy, mostly known from our self-powered switches by means of electrodynamic energy generation. We work with solar energy, as used uh, in EMDC and also in the multi-sensor that we recently discussed. So here ambient light is harvested using solar cells. But many products also use thermal energy. They can generate energy through temperature differences. So for instance, on a radiator, you can leverage the temperature difference between the radiator itself and the environment to power a radiator bulb. So we generate the power for EMDC using a solar cell. And now the main application, of course, is to detect motion. We detect the presence of people by their motion. How does this physically work? Motion detectors use so-called PIR sensors. PIR means passive infrared. So these are sensors that receive the heat radiation of human bodies and of all objects in general. And what these sensors do is they look for changes in these heat radiation that are caused by people moving around. And these changes, uh, these heat radiation changes are focused by small lenses as the one you see on the bottom left that can be used to cover specific areas. So you have different lenses to cover very wide areas, very narrow areas, uh, long distance, short distance. And here EMDC is optimized for office monitoring use cases. So we have dimensioned the lens to enable motion detection within approximately five meter radius when it is mounted two and a half meters high. Now, of course, yeah, you can enable much wider field uh, of detection so that you can cover a whole office in a 10 meter range. But then what happens is if somebody walks outside your office, uh, then the motion detector might report that your office is optimized. So typically you optimize uh, the amount of coverage for the intended application. And in our case, we have uh, set a five meter radius for this. It is possible to reduce the, the area capture by reducing the sensitivity to limit the capture to smaller areas of approximately three meter radius. Now, another important information is uh, not only that I have a uh, motion in a certain area, but especially for light control, I want to understand, is it light? Is enough ambient light already available? Or do I need to control uh, the lighting system? 
Therefore, EMDC provides uh, two options for ambient light measurements. It provides a dedicated light level sensor that measures very accurately the light directly in front of the sensor. So if you have it, uh, if you have the sensor mounted on a ceiling, it will measure the light level directly underneath the sensor, which typically is your desk surface. It has a spectral response similar to human eye, so it will perceive the light in the same way as you would do. It is used to measure the light level at a specific location. In other use cases, you want to understand how much light is coming into your room over a wide area. This is typically the case for daylighting application, as we discussed before, where you want to adjust the light level uh, in your room based on uh, the amount of incoming light. So this is done using the calibrated solar cell that will tell you how much light is received. And if you orient this uh, towards the windows in your room, you will see that uh, you can measure the result uh, of incoming light. In addition, this is also used to verify if there is sufficient light available for energy harvesting because the solar cell is powering the device. Now, once you have uh, measured occupancy, motion uh, and light level, you need to communicate this to your receiver. And for wireless communication, an ocean believes very strongly in open standards. So first of all, we work uh, with an entity called an ocean alliance. This standardizes uh, both the radio and the application level of a radio protocol uh, based on ISO 14543. This was founded over 10 years ago, has today more than 400 members that have created over 5,000 interoperable products that are deployed in millions of buildings today. In addition to an ocean alliance, we also work uh, with Bluetooth and with Zigbee on the standardization of energy harvesting into their existing ecosystems, uh, especially in the area of lighting control. In an ocean alliance today, we work with a number of key partners, uh, such uh, these are large companies such as IBM, Microsoft, T-Systems, Virtuos, ING, and recently uh, we just announced uh, that Aruba, an HP company, making Wi-Fi -Fi access points has become member of an ocean alliance. In addition, we work uh, with specialized uh, companies uh, that have strong focus on building automation, such as uh, El Taco, Honeywell, BSC, ABB, and others. Now, finally, uh, not only do you need to measure your device parameters, you also need to be able to set up the device according uh, to your needs. So you need to be able to tell the receiver Here's a light level sensor, here's a motion detector, it has a certain ID and a certain security key. And this configuration process is one key cost saving opportunity because the time you need to spend uh, on a construction site configuring devices directly impacts your revenue. So therefore, in our latest generation products, uh, we use an NFC interface that can be easily configured, both uh, using a dedicated smartphone application and using a PC tool. So this allows installers at the construction site to just use their smartphone to configure the device. And it allows uh, our partners uh, in the manufacturing phase to use a PC tool to parameterize the different devices. So all of this functionality, motion detection, illumination measurement, NFC configuration is integrated in EMDC in a self-powered uh, device intended for ceiling mounting. So with this, uh, I would like to give you the opportunity to ask uh, questions. We, uh, please uh, submit questions uh, using the chat functionality. Uh, let, me, let me put this out here. So just a moment, uh, I'm gonna look uh, for the questions here. So well, what, uh, what do I see uh, in questions? So for... Uh, uh, first uh, of all, a question regarding the current sit situation. Uh, today we, we experience Corona. Do you see any change in the demand for your solutions based on that? So actually, yes, we see. Uh, what we observe is a lot of demand uh, in solutions that can be easily installed and allow you to track if certain office spaces uh, are used. 
So this can be individual desk monitoring solutions like we introduced uh, a month ago with our multi-sensor. This can be very simple uh, solutions uh, for office space uh, monitoring. So today, yes, uh, we see a lot of uh, this demand uh, from, uh, from customers. So there's a lot of urgency there. Now there, there are a number of questions uh, related to where can I buy uh, the sensor? Can I buy it in Germany? Can I buy it uh, worldwide? So this is a question for my uh, colleague, uh, Markus Florian. So he will be uh, very happy uh, to get in, uh, in touch with you based on that. Then uh, there's a question uh, from John Riley. Are these sensors able to count people or just detect occupation? So count, counting people uh, is indeed something uh, that we uh, get very often uh, as a question. So ideally you would like to know not only there is somebody in the room, but uh, in the office space today, there are five people. So our, our peer, our EMDC sensor will indicate there is somebody in the office. What we also offer is a product variant that is called the EPAC, the in Ocean People Activity Counter that works by determining the activity. So how much uh, movement there is in an area. And this information can be used uh, together uh, with information about the office type. Is it a meeting room? Is it a kitchen? Uh, is it a normal office? To estimate uh, the amount of people uh, in a room. So there, there's another question. Uh, uh, what kind of NFC readers uh, can we use? Every standalone reader available on the market. So the NFC interface implemented is a standard uh, NFC interface. So it's a ISO standard, ISO 14443. So any NFC reader capable of reading this data can be used. Now, important information, we in Ocean uh, provide a configuration application uh, that can be used on a PC. And this works with one specific uh, NFC reader type that we uh, selected. But it's possible to license uh, this application subject to commercial conditions. So this is something uh, that can work with any uh, NFC reader. We have one reference implementation, but uh, all of those uh, would work. So then uh, how do you calibrate uh, the light measuring system? So uh, what we do is, uh, first of all, the sensor itself uh, is calibrated uh, at a factory. Uh, so this has a calibrated spectral response. Then what we do is uh, at manufacturing, we calibrate uh, the effect of the small cover in front of the sensor. So the damping that it gives you, this will be calibrated uh, using a standardized uh, light source that has a defined output light level. So we calibrate the insertion loss uh, for that. So uh, let me check uh, what other questions uh, do we have. Uh, we have the question, uh, why is it not integrated in a, directly in luminaires if they are in a ceiling? Uh, indeed, we see uh, many different applications where you have uh, luminaires with integrated uh, PIR sensors. So especially uh, if you upgrade your system to the latest uh, luminaires. But it's, this has two problems. Now imagine you have a short-term need to understand uh, office occupancy. You want to install a simple solution without going through retrofitting uh, all your luminaires. So the advantage of using separate uh, PIR sensors is uh, that they can be very easily installed. And of course, it's typically a lot more cost effective. You put one of these sensors uh, in the middle of your room and do not need one uh, in each of the luminaires. So we are now reaching uh, the end uh, of the scheduled time. I can see we have uh, several remaining questions. So please allow us uh, to come back to you via email uh, with the answers. So with this, uh, I would like to uh, give back uh, to my colleague, uh, Markus Florian, with an outlook uh, on our next webinars. Okay, thanks, Matthias. This was a very interesting introduction and overview about our PIR product. Um, so yes, uh, let me give you an outlook on to what will be coming next uh, in the in our webinar series on the 12th of August we will be talking and introducing you to the all new uh, relationship between Aruba and the an ocean and of course in that webinar explain you also what are the new possibilities through this cooperation so there will be a lot of new possibilities and applications we can cover so of course we are aware that this is uh, mid of August uh, so some people might be on vacation but of course we hope that you will still join us in learning more about uh, this uh, technology and partnership. 
And um, then, of course, uh, we have seen uh, some comments that some of you may have had some hiccups uh, during the webinar session. So you will be at the end uh, get an email with a link of um, the video. So there will be a possibility to replay the entire webinar. So in case you have missed some sections of our presentation, there will be a good chance that you can then have the full presentation again. Um, then let me conclude uh, that at the end we will uh, have also the, the contact details. So in case, as uh, Matthias was mentioning, uh, you have additional questions, just contact us. We will be pleased to answer uh, to your questions. And then, of course, uh, we will be concluding and looking forward to meet you during our next webinar session. So thanks and goodbye.